Great. Uh, again, welcome everyone to the GitHub uh, skill up session. Uh, I will be following along with a slide uh, that I have shared in the etherpad, but it's also in the chat. So let me start by sharing. All right, so this workshop will be given by me and Yo, and we're gonna split um, across the different material. Again, the document that we are using is in the etherpad. We will also add that in the YouTube description if you're watching it later. And here are some training material if you would like to come back to. So today we will talk about what version control is and why it's important. So we're starting from the research point of view that we need to version control our research materials. Then we will switch to GitHub because GitHub is something that we like to use, but GitHub is only one of several different tools. We will talk about Markdown. Markdown is a formatting language, which is quite simple. and It allows us to format a simple document beautifully. You will hear a child crying at the background. That's my nephew. And then we will have exercises. So you will have chance to edit documents like a readme file that you just learned last week. We will also edit GitHub page by making a pull request. So we will try to bust the jargon what this PR is or what pull request is called. And at the end, we hope that each of you go out from this workshop making a small website for yourself or your, um, or your project. So this is, in our opinion, is really empowering when you can put out your material in a browsable format online. And you don't need to know a lot of coding and not, nothing actually with the GitHub at all. And we will also show you some features. If we are not able to show you those features, these materials are available and we've, we've added everything in this slide. So um, first of all, we all work on collaborative documents. Uh, you all have written documents, either paper, your thesis, or it could be a slide that you made with somebody. Um, and this can be very challenging when you're working with different people distributed across the globe uh, who may or may not know what you exactly want. So also it's very asynchronous, especially when we are working in different time zones, uh, you can have multiple people editing the same thing and there are versions, right? So when you create a document and someone adds something to it, they make a different version of it, then you, accept their edits, then you create a third version of it because all of these have different information. So this is how it would look like. Let's imagine you have a folder either in your computer or you can think of Google folder, Google document, uh, which we would call repository here because this is something that we would use for GitHub. And in, in that folder, you have multiple files. And these files are uh, either written document or a code. So what happens is that you can add more folders, you can edit in more files, uh, you can remove some lines, and there is a timeline where all of these are happening. There are steps when you add, edit, or remove. So what, what they are called is revision and version. So you've added something, that's your one version, you removed something, that's another version. So you see this circle, you have uh, edited something, and so on. It goes on when you're working with multiple people and you want to actually preserve those different versions, especially for example, if you're coding, uh, one version of code works on one version of data, another version of code works on different version of data. So you wanna preserve those information. But what happens a lot of time when we are starting out, when we're creating these kind of versions, they can be named very fuzzily, right? You can have a document uh, which you start as work copy, then you maybe have added, you, you might have filtered some of the information, then you call it work copy filter, then you counted something, you call it, call it work copy count, and all these files are accumulating in your folder, and there are multiple of those. And there's, those are really hard to go back to because they don't tell you exactly when they were created. But when we are doing version control, there is a systematic preservation of the information which you can always go back to when you need to. So this is what we want to do, right? We want to not have multiple copies of the file. We want to have one copy of the file and we should have a way to go back to that file in the version format. So you have worked with version control. So it's not just GitHub, but the version control can be done by a Google Drive. In the Google Drive, you have um, actually the whole preservation of history. 
uh, when you're working on etherpad in the etherpad you will see a timer when you click on the timer it actually allows you to browse through what was written in the back and then you have git uh, which is something that we will discuss today so git is a advanced tool it's a local version control system and github is actually made on that so you can work locally in your computer and you can change you can send those information online which is on github so what we call revision is change associated with a timestamp and details like what changes were made and who made them and why so all these information and the benefit is that you can collaborate in real time, store history, go back to the previous previous version without getting confused or uh, stopping your collaborators from working with you. So now imagine this, uh, the way of working on GitHub. So that's you, and these are your collaborator. What you did is you created a file um, and you edited something, which is fixed widget. One of your collaborator actually deleted something and another collaborator added loads of information. And all these information are actually are preserved in different distributed computers. So we are allowing each other to send all the distributed information in the same branch. So this might seem a bit abstract right now, but we're gonna do some hands-on exercise on this. So hopefully that would get easier. So now GitHub, what is this? GitHub is where people have been building software for several years. It's not open source, but it is openly available for us to use. It hosts your repository and repository is just another word, word for projects online. It helps you work with your contributors. It provides a web interface so that you don't need to know coding if you're not very comfortable with it. And it can be used for project management as well, which we will not see today, but we will see next week. But it's good to know that these things are possible. And it is useful for any project where a group of people are working together. It doesn't have to be a coding or software related uh, work. It could be documentation. It could be a website. It could be anything where multiple people are working together in a distributed environment. So before we go forward, I would like to code along. Code along is not the right word. Work along with you. So whatever I'm showing, I hope you would be able to do at the same time. So I would like to stop at this point and check with emoji if you all have GitHub account. Can you give me a thumbs up or any emoji from the reaction? If you don't have, we'll wait for a couple of minutes for everyone to have the GitHub account. So we have Caitlin, Eliza, Sarah, and Saranjeet. Um, can I check with Lena if you've got... So I have yes from Burche as well. So, I'm waiting for Lena and Mike to see if they have GitHub account as well. Awesome, everybody have it. Perfect, you all came prepared, I'm super excited. So now I'm gonna go back, but I'm not gonna share my screen anymore because I have it memorized. What we're gonna do is show you how to create your own repository, right? So, at this point, even though I'm stopping using of um, slides, I will come back to it and you're welcome to go back on your own. So when you have a web, when you have a profile, your profile should have your name, you can add some keyword and so on. So this is my profile and you would have your own profile. You don't need to add images. It's just, I have it for a few years now. So we're gonna start by creating a new repository. So if you wanna create a new repository, there is a plus symbol on the right top and you click on new repository. At this point, you can start actually working with me on your own uh, computer. So I want to create a new repository, so I'll give, you, give it a name and I will call it friendly collab party. And this repository, you can do as a dummy with me by calling it same, friendly collab party, or if you want to use this repository for your project, already start by writing your project's name here. And we want to keep it public. We want to have it public. Another thing that we want to do is we want to add the readme file. At this point, you already know what readme file is, so I will not explain in detail, but readme file is a landing page of your repository where you add information about what this repository is about. So we will click on that and say add readme file. 
So you don't need to know any further at this point. And what I'm going to do right now, you can totally ignore because uh, this is very specifically for this demo. So I'm creating a repository under Open Life Science, but you don't need to do you. You just have to have your user ID and repository name. And we're going to click on create repository. So this has now created a repository for me called Friendly Collab Party. And it says Malvika Sharan initial commit. We'll explain in a bit what commit means. OK, can I then now get a thumbs up that you all have one repository, either your test version or for your project? Um, Caitlin, you can skip the license right now because you might want to spend some time considering what kind of license you need. You can absolutely add license. We'll show you that as well. Um, but at the moment, just skip it uh, for the moment. Yeah. Everyone got a repository. Awesome. OK, so now this is, this is already a repository, and we can already do a lot of things. So we have a readme file. We will start by editing the readme file. So you have this pencil symbol. You all should see it. And we click on the pencil symbol. My first thing is that I don't like how my repository name is written, right? I wanted to actually say capital F, delete that, capital C, delete that, and capital P. So I did one simple edit, and I will write a sentence saying, this is my test repository for OLS for cohort. GitHub workshop. Okay, so that's what I did, but you can write one sentence about anything. And now I will commit directly on the main branch, but I will add added a sentence. This is a information about what change I am making. So because it is an example, this doesn't seem like, oh, this does, does not need a lot of information, but just imagine if you're adding a vision statement, you might want to write that I'm adding a vision statement and so on. And without doing anything else, we are going to commit changes. The commit changes now reflects directly on my repository, right? So my repository earlier had friendly collab party and nothing else, but at the moment it has one sentence. So if you want to know, let's say, can people have added some sort of information and you came the next day and it's all full and you don't really know who did what, you are gonna click on the history button and the history button will show you who did what. So at the moment, it's just me or in your repository, it would be you who's writing it. So you would see that three minutes ago, I created the repository with the initial commit. And then 25 seconds ago, I create, added a sentence. So over time period, you would have multiple lines or so multiple uh, information. So every saving of the file is called commit, which is what you see here. So here I'm gonna go back. So you've created your first repository. You can always come back to this to see what different tabs mean, but we're not gonna go in detail of that. And congrats, you've created your first repository. You've created a readme file. So one thing that you might have noticed is that in my repository, now if you want to go back to it, I'm going to click here. And I'm going to click again. There is a one hash symbol, right? The hash symbol is not by chance or not by mistake. This is something we call markdown. And this is why your readme started, ends with .md. The .md means markdown because this file is markdown file. You might have seen .txt file, which stands for text file. So these extensions basically reflect what kind of file that is. So when you use one hash symbol, it shows you the first header. So here is one example. So one hash symbol is first level header, two hash symbol, second level, three, and so on. After four, it doesn't make sense because it's just bold letter, right? And then you can create bullet point list as well. So rather than watching it, why don't we do it, right? Let's, let's create a second level and I will call it roadmap for my project. And this project is basically I'm teaching. So my project is first I want to teach. So I'm going to use a um, asterisk symbol. 
And the first thing is create a repository. My second is, and, and as you see, when I push enter, um, uh, asterisk already appears and you don't need to do that, but, but you can always do it too. Add readme, edit readme, and create PR, which I will show you later. So now rather than committing it directly, I want to see before I commit. And there is a thing called preview. When you click on preview, it actually shows you that, oh yeah, you know, my second level header actually looks smaller than the first letter, uh, first header. And here are my bullet point list. Now I want to create another list, which is numbered list. And I want to call it breakout rooms. To create numbered list, you want to start by adding one point and the breakout room. My first breakout room would be probably ask you, ask everyone to create uh, their readme and then create a web page. These are exemplary, right? Like you don't need to write exactly what I'm writing. These are for you to see what happens really. So now if you go back, you see that instead of non-numbered list, you have numbered list. And I, I'm happy with it. I'm going to go down and say added roadmap and breakout info. And I will commit change. So you have a bigger readme file. So if I go back to my main repository, we'll see I have one file, which is called readme, and this has all the information. So Markdown is a lot more than what we just did, and um, I hope that you have a chance to explore that. The last thing I will do is add uh, an image. Um, so I have already selected an image that I want to add, and I'll uh, share with you if you would like to reuse it. This is the image I want to use. Um, this actually shows really well that this is me who's creating a repository, sending it to GitHub and the GitHub is a web server and my coworker is working. And to me, it looked really nice. I'm gonna copy image link. I go back. I start with, I'm gonna increase the size if you can't see it. I start with this exclamation mark, square bracket, round bracket. And inside the round bracket, I would add the link. The square bracket is where you actually provide an alt text. So uh, here you would have explanation of the image, which I'm not doing, unfortunately, because of lack of time, but you would in principle do it, right? And now if I go to the preview, you would see that I have added an image, right? This is amazing because I had a very boring looking readme and I could add an image. You could add emojis, you can add GIF if you would like, you can, you can embed uh, videos, but this is already a good progress. The last thing I wanna do is I will give image source, which is the link where I found it. So people know where to find this. And in order to create a hyperlink, so you can have image source like this and add link here, but I want to actually hyperlink it. So I'm going to just keep that for example, and I create image source. And this is exactly like the image, but instead of adding an, an, an exclama exclama exclamation mark, I'm not doing anything. I'm creating a square, adding what word I want, and I'm hyperlinking it. And if I go on preview, you could see that the hyperlink actually appears like this. If you don't hyperlink, it would still be a link, but it would be full link. And with that, I will. I'm just gonna finish my uh, editing, added image and source link. And with that, I commit changes and here you go. You have your readme file with list of information and image and where this image comes from. So you might have used this already in HackMD if you, if you and your mentor are using it for your weekly meeting. But if not, then uh, we have also provided a cheat sheet 
both in the etherpad and in the slide. So you can always come back to it. And this is really interesting. And it's unfortunate that we don't have time to explore that because we want to take more time for the later work that we will do. So just a review of uh, creating a readme page, which is a landing page for your repository. Um, you would add information about your project. And this, this information could be uh, if it is a vision statement, mission statement, roadmap, and everything you would actually build on in the rest of the week in the cohort calls. Right, so with that, I think we are happy to go forward and uh, learn all these GitHub vocabulary. These GitHub vocabulary sound like English, but they aren't English because they don't make sense. So you've already seen commit. We will learn about what branching and forking means, what pull request is, and what merging is. So you saw that commit is saving a version. So if I go back now again, and I click on the history, in the history, you see that I've done four commits. So this is one commit, two commit, three commit, four commit. And generally the commit is symbolized by this circle symbol, which is this, that you could see. So picture, if I, I want to actually use a lot of picture today, hopefully that is more, um, you know, that makes more sense. So you have one main repository, which is uh, this C1, and we made some change. So there's a second version. Going forward from that, we can learn about branching. So branching is that when you have a main repository and the main repository has some changes made, that change can be split into two by branching it. Um, and I will actually show you before I explain that. So it makes sense. So, so far what I did is that I have been writing and committing my change directly on the readme file. What I will do now is create something else. I will create another header, uh, things to do after this workshop. And I would say, um, create your OLS project repo. Uh, create, oh wait, sorry, add vision and roadmap, and finally create a website. But I don't want this to appear on my uh, main repository. So instead of committing directly to the main branch, I will click on this, which you can see that there is a commit, but there is a new branching that is happening. And I'll show you again, don't uh, be patient with me and I'll uh, explain what is happening now. So I'm gonna create after the workshop. So I named my branch after the workshop and I propose change. So when I propose change, something happened. It wasn't that easy as we were doing direct commit on the repository. It says open a pull request. So when you create a branch, you have to make a change and let people know that you are creating this branch. So here I will write, created a new branch with post workshop. Info. So I would add summary, added a few bullet points. I'm keeping it very short, but in you know a lot of examples that you would see would be uh, full of information. Uh, they would be multiple lines, so people know what exactly is happening. And I will click on this and call. It says create pull request. We will come back to this again, so uh, you know what exactly happened. So now, if I go back to my repository, you see that my file hasn't changed, even though I made some change just now it's because we are in the main branch. So do you see it on the top? So you are in the main branch. In the main branch, your file is as it was, but I have created another branch, which is called after the workshop. And when you see in after the workshop, you have a file, which is different from main branch. So this is what is happening. That we, I had a main, sorry, I have to unmute mute somebody because I'm getting a background noise. So we have a main branch, that branch had some changes. I made a version of that branch for myself 
while someone else can work on the main branch itself. So this is what it looks like open life science repo name, right? So that's the open life science repository name. Now, second thing is forking and forking is different from main branch. When you create a main branch, the expectation is that after you've finished working, you're gonna send all those changes into your repository. But there's a, word, there's a thing called forking and you, with the fork, you create a version of that file yourself. So this was your branching, but forking is that you make a file for yourself. And again, rather than showing it, it's talking about this, I'm going to show you. So when you go on this repository, you would see that there is this word called fork. And when you click on fork, it should be able to fork it for you. But because uh, I haven't allowed that to happen, um, I will send you, I will show you another repository that, would, that we would do as fork. So this is another repository where we will ask you to fork it. So this is exactly like the friendly collab party, but this is a different repository that we have in open life science. And this repository have some information. For example, we have a readme file and this readme file have information about what this repository is about, how to work with us and what are the participation guidelines. And I've also added multiple other files. And I, I am interested in this and I want to create a copy of this, pro, this repo in my own repository, in my own profile. Sorry for the jargons. So now I click on the fork and the fork say, where should I fork it? And hopefully it doesn't ask you to do that. So I'm forking it in my own profile. So original file was open life science forward slash OLS4. I created a fork of it and the fork is inside Malvika Sharan forward slash OLS4. So here is Malvika Sharan repo name. So originally you have open life science repo name, I created a fork. And this fork is a version of that file for myself. I have no obligation to send changes that I make in my repository to others. So this is what I mean are the difference. The difference is when I was working in a repository, I created a branch, the branch changes can be sent back to the repository. But when I create a fork, I can, for example, go back and edit this by adding in information, Malvika's copy, and I can directly commit change. And this change is only reflected in my repository, not in the main OLS4 repository. So the OLS4 repository will not be affected by what I do. And even if this repository is deleted, my copy of file will not be deleted. So that was a lot. So I'm gonna stop for a second and ask you if branching and forking made sense and what question you have at this point. Okay, so if we don't have a question, we have one last, I have one last thing to do before I hand it over to you. Thanks, Elisa, that's reaffirming. Um, <laughs> sorry, we have a question. Yeah, that's a very good point. So now I'm gonna show you when will you use them. Um, so what I want to do is now I want to collaborate with you on this repository. And actually I would ask you all to collaborate with you at some point. So we have one copy of this file, right? Um, what I want to do is just gonna delete this because I don't actually want that. And I commit change. In the OLS4, we have a file for this week, which is week five, which is notes. So I've sent you the link to that. And in here, we have exactly the same file as you have in the etherpad. And in etherpad, you each of you have number. And I would like you to edit that. So um, I will add information on line number 52, Malvika birds chirping. And this is a pull request I will send to you, add 
Malvika ripples chained. Adding my name and I create pull request. Right, so I created a pull request for you. But another thing that happened was if I go back here, there is no pull request, right? So what I did is in my case, I have created a pull request for myself. When I click on file change, it shows me what changes actually occurred. So again, to differentiate where you are, at the moment I'm in Malvika Sharan OLS4, and it says it's forked from Open Life Science OLS4. In my case, I've created a pull request in my own repository. And if because it's just me at the moment, I have nothing else to do, but I can say merge pull request, right? But in your case, now, so that's one pull request, but if let's say Yo was working with me on this, she would be the person who would review my repository and merge the request. So at the moment, I'm just gonna go ahead and merge that. And now there is no pull request because that says the one, one pull request has been closed. Now I'll go and click on new pull request and new pull request would ask me to send change to the main repository. So I'm here and it's asking me, do you want to send change that you did to your main repository? I'll click there, yes, Malvika. And now I create pull request. So at this point, my pull request has gone directly to OLS. So as you would see, it's here. Um, it's a bit confusing, I know, but I'm gonna show you once, once, once again, just so we're all clear what I have done. So I'm going to go back to my profile. In my profile, my repository, existing repositories, I go to OLS4. What I did is go on week five, week five notes, edit information. And this I edit information. I added, a, I'm adding a bit more, right? So, I, so because I'm working on my repository, I don't want to create a pull request. I would directly commit it on the master branch. And now I, once I've committed the change and I'm ready to send the change to the main repository, I'll click on pull request, create new pull request. And then it will ask me to create one. Once I've added that, it will um, take me to the open life science because now I made the change in my local repository, send changes to my main repository. So what is happening is that I was here, I, this is OLS4, I created a, I forked the OLS4 repository, I created a copy of that in my own profile. The main repository can go on working and I can go on working on my version without affecting each other. Once I was done, so once I was uh, done with that, I will, I created a pull request. And the pull request is, and this is very, very weird looking repository, but for example, I created a fork of it. I made a change and I'm, I want to now send back that change to the main repository. So this is the main repository. I created a fork, made the change. I want to send back my changes. And this sending back the change is actually called pull request. So what happens with the pull request is now rather than changing anything without someone else's knowledge, you're sending an information and asking the owner of the repository or your collaborator to review it and tell you if this looks good and should they merge it. So a lot of time when we write a lot of things, we need feedback. And this is a draft version that people will actually review and make feedback. 
And this is how we make collaboration. So it makes a lot of sense when multiple people are working, which we will see in a minute when you would have a chance to work on it. So this is what we've done. I made the change. I created a pull request and I sent back my information to that. So now I'm going to send it to Yo so she can show you how she would do review and merge it. And if you have any question, please let me know. Yo, I can't hear you. So I'm just going to meanwhile answer uh, Sebastian's uh, question. Sebastian, you have to have the same name. When you create a fork of one repository, then you can send. But there is, yes, there is way to send pull requests from a different repository, but that's a bit too complicated. And I can send you information about that. And I always have to Google because I don't have it in my mind how you do it. But there is an option to send pull request from a different name, but what we are showing is very simple forking and sending it back. Testing, testing, can you hear me? Okay, right. Um, so I'm just gonna look at this question we have from Sarah. So then let's say you would use forking rather than branching when you need someone else reviewing the changes, for example, that's a very good way of looking at it, yeah. Um, and I, I consider a pull request uh, polite, please look at this and merge it if you think it's ready, rather than just dropping it in there and hoping it's all good. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share my screen, share screen, and this one here. Okay, um, so folks, can you see the GitHub screen? Mm, yes, we can. You, you can, perfect, right. I'll just make it a little bit bigger. So this is the repository where Marvika has been doing most of her experimenting and I'm on the open life science repository rather than Malvika's copy. Um, and I happen to know, um, let's say I got a notification in my inbox that there was a pull request that came in. So I go and click on pull requests uh, because I want to review what Malvika has been doing and I want to make sure that it uh, looks like something we should merge and make it part of our repository. So I'm just going to click on it here, look at Malvika's info. And it straight away gives me a lot of information about what's going on. So I can see that it's coming from her repository, from the master branch. And I can see that she's done quite a few changes before she made the pull request. So she's updated the readme a couple of times. She's updated the week five notes and she's merged a pull request in her own branch. And I can tell she's done that because it says Malvika Sharan here and um, not Open Life Science. Um, but I want to know some of the details about what she's actually changed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click here on files changed and I'm going to see the changes. Um, and so actually, even though there were five different commits, some of the time she um, literally undid what she'd already been doing. So it doesn't show those because in the end, it's, it's like there's no change at all. And like she made a change to the readme name, but then reverted it. So this is why we can only see that there has been one line that has changed. You can see line 52 and the minus here behind it means that name one, this line was removed and it was replaced with this line with the plus here, name one, Movika and birds chirping in my hometown. And I think yeah, you know what, that's probably good enough. Um, I think we can accept this, this request, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so I can do a couple of things, I can review it. So I could, for example, just say, yeah, this is good, thanks for the PR. Um, if there was a reason where I had decided maybe she needed to change, maybe, maybe there was a typo, or maybe um, like a link was broken or something like that, then I could instead, I could request changes and then provide some information. Uh, so please change the line to mention flowers as well, for example. Um, but in this case, no, I'm, I'm very happy with this. So I'm just gonna approve it. Um, I'll click on the submit review button. And it now shows us that the changes are approved. Um, and one thing I should mention is that reviewing PRs isn't mandatory. 
um, it is merely a useful step that you can do. Um, so it could even be that you'd ask for two or three reviews before you merge something or that there's zero reviews, either is fine. Um, but reviewing is not the same as merging. Uh, and the reason for that is, for example, if you wanted multiple reviews for some reason, um, let's say you want to be really sure that nothing ever broke, you might want to say we want to have two reviews before we merge. Um, so I haven't merged it yet, um, but given that I've approved it, and I don't think in this case we need any other approvals, um, then I'm also now going to merge it as well. And so that is this beautiful button here. So I can just click on the big green confirm merge. Um, if I want, I can actually change the title of this or I can change the text that it's been committed with. Looks really good. I like birds. Um, but you don't have to change anything. Sometimes that can be useful, again, if you want to fix a typo or if you want to add some description or maybe say what you've reviewed, then you might want to add some comments here, but it's, it's not mandatory. And then I will click Confirm Merge. And so now you can see we've got this little icon here saying that the commit has been merged um, and it's effectively closed. So now if I go back to pull requests, it no longer shows, um, but there are three closed pull requests and you can see here um, that we have in fact successfully merged and approved Movica's info. And then if I go and I look at the code, then um, you can see, uh, oh yeah, that's right, it was in week five. In week five and week five notes, scroll down a little bit and da da, I can see Malvika's birds are chirping. Um, so I think looking at the time, um, I reckon, do you think we should do a quick demo? Let people have a go at themselves? I've got nods from Malvika, so I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, um, so we will break out into, um, I think, two breakout rooms. I know we've had a few people who've joined um, since the start of the call. So could I just ask everyone to quickly add a W for written or an S for spoken, depending on whether you prefer spoken or written breakout room, just to the front of, the, um, to the front of your name in Zoom. Um, and I'm just going to read through the chat and see if there's any questions while this is happening. Okay, so just quick check, Sebastian, is your preference written or uh, spoke? Oh, yeah, you've changed it. Never mind. Okay, looks like we have the right shapes of breakout rooms. Everyone is labeled. Um, Malvika, are the breakout rooms ready to go? Nearly. Okay, um, so anyway, whilst Malvika is just sorting the breakout rooms, um, as a reminder, what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, the Etherpad notes that we have figure out what number your name is on, um, and then go and copy and paste that into, um, the, into GitHub and make a pull request to make this change. Um, so I will paste the repository that you're making the pull requests against and the file into the chat right now. And you don't have to put your name. Um, you can replace it with anything. Flower, teddy bear, doesn't have to be your name or it can be your name if you don't mind putting your name on there as well. Um, but we will send you into breakout rooms. It's okay to ask questions and discuss with your breakout roommates if you're not sure what you're doing. Um, if you get stuck at any point, then you can also use the um, ask for help uh, option in the breakout rooms and then Malvika or I will teleport into the room and we will uh, walk through and there is no shame. There are no questions too small or too stupid, none whatsoever, especially since I know a couple of you have joined uh, partway through, so you may have missed the introduction. Uh, so it's absolutely fine to ask these questions. Um, how are we doing for breakout rooms? Uh, it's ready. Just want to remind that please use the number as you have in the etherpad to avoid conflict. So people aren't writing in the same line, but they're using different line to edit. I'm going to open the rooms. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We have six pull requests. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to merge. So share screen. I'll select that desktop. Share. And can you all see? Uh, I've got a thumbs up. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to go in a very arbitrary order. I'm going to go for this one first. So I'm going to click on it. 
quickly review. I can see name four. Okay, it looks good to me. I'm not going to bother reviewing it this time, and I'm just going to merge and confirm merge. Looking good. Go back to the next one and week five notes. Once again, double checking. Name nine. Yep, different line. Safe and easy. No conflicts. Merge and merge. Go back to pull requests. Let's go for Jyoti. And no conflicts. Looking good. Looking good. And three down, three to go. Let's try Sarah's. Files changed. Yep, just one line on name three. Looking good. Uh, ah, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, it said it's conflicting. We'll look at this later. We'll deal with it later. These take a little bit longer to resolve. Don't worry about it. No one did anything wrong here, by the way. And two conflicts. Okay, cool. So I'm going to really quickly look at this just to explain what a conflict means. Um, but these take a little bit longer to resolve. So I won't go through resolving it right now. And so the, ah, the reason that we have a conflict here is probably related to that someone else has made a change on this line as well. Um, and so again, this is nothing wrong. This is something that's normal that happens as part of the collaborations. Um, but when multiple people edit the same line, it means that you have to choose which of the lines you want to keep and be the canonical copy. Uh, so we will deal with this later, um, deal with the merges, um, and you, you can harmonize it. It's not too much because it's only a couple of lines that are going on. But in the meantime, what we can do is we can look at the four pull requests that we did merge without conflicts. Um, so if you recall, we had one name before, which was Malvika's name. So I'm actually going to go into week five and I'm going to look at the week five notes. And we can see that, dum, 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 here we go. All, all the four requests that we merged successfully, we have uh, showed and they have um, integrated and they're all part of the same document. And I'm also really quickly going to use a feature that is an awfully, awfully named feature called blame. And I'm just going to show that it tells you who wrote every single line. And I don't like blame because it implies that there's something wrong. Um, but it's really useful if you want to know who's updated everything. So now we can see line by line, Malvika updated this line. Here we can see Jyoti, we can see Portia, we can see Caitlin, and we can see Sebastian. Um, and so it's a really nice way of actually getting cut. Uh, credit for all of the different bits of documentation. So um, I'm going to move on with where we were and I'm going to hop over to creating an issue. Um, so this is another feature that is really useful when you're collaborating in GitHub. Uh, the word issue, um, I consider it like, imagine like just like I've got a post-it note as in don't forget to do this thing. Um, and so it can be, even though issue is a slightly negative connotations, I very often use it for a new feature or a new suggestion or a new idea. Um, and so it can be a really useful way of collecting what is going to be happening in the future. For example, you might want to report a bug or a mistake. Um, so here's a typo in the website, for example, um, or it might be that you want a discussion because you can, you can answer um, in issues. So there are two things that are important here. One is giving a descriptive header. Um, so a title, same as you would do in an email, you want to have the subject be something short and concise that, is, that, and then you want to have in the body of the issue, you describe something in more in depth. Um, and this is something that most of you will have already done as part of the Open Life Science OLS4 repo. I'm going to do the same on OLS4 week five, um, just as a demo. So here we've got a whole bunch of issues from various people's projects that they're working on. I'm going to make another one um, and I was hoping that there would be the non-templated version that's fine I'm just going to go for this green button here anyway um, I'm not using the template text here that we want in this case um, this is largely a dummy issue to give the idea of what this might be uh, so in fact one thing that I know that I need to do is fix merge issues for the two PRs currently open. Uh, so that's a reasonably short, concise and clear title. And then there are a couple of conflicts in our new PRs. We need to fix this um, and then submit new issue. And this is now something that anyone could pick up, comment on, discuss, etc. So if I wanted to do so, I could leave a comment in here um, and say, I'll, I'll pick this up. 
facilitator. Um, and I could even assign myself and say that I'm the person who's going to be dealing with it. Um, so there's a really nice way of collaborating and making it clear who's working on what and who's been picking up specific things within a project, which is one of the reasons that it's really nice for project management. So moving on from issues, actually very quickly, any questions about issues um, after that whistle stop super fast tour or any other questions on pull requests that I didn't give you the chance to ask? Thanks, folks. Um, I, I, I always appreciate the encouragement. Right, I shall move on. I will reshare. And I should be sharing. Cool. So we've created an issue. Um, so just to talk a bit about the difference between issues and pull requests. Um, so pull requests are a request for something that you've already done. So I say here, I've done some work. Please merge it into what you're working on. Issues are a way to perhaps discuss something before you make a pull request, which can be really useful. Because um, it might be, um, I think one of the worst things that you, you can feel is if you if you do something and then people are like, actually, we didn't really want this. And you're like, but I spent hours on it. Um, so maybe make an issue, say, can we fix this? Should we fix this? You can discuss it with other people collaboratively um, and then actually make the pull request once the, the amendments are agreed. Um, so it's a very useful, also, it's a good way of keeping track of stuff if you can't do it right now. Um, so it might be that, you know, this particular bit of work is going to take you five hours or longer. And so you, you leave a note, you leave an issue, and that way it's, it, people can keep track of it and come back to it later. Um, so these are public uh, when you write issues, assuming that you have the repository set to public, and it means that people know what you're working on, which is convenient. Um, so, so if someone's getting really frustrated because of a bug, for example, or a typo or a mistake, if they come and they say that the issue is already there, then they can say, yeah, this affects me too, and they won't need to create another issue as well. Um, it also invites collaboration. Sometimes people might say, hey, I can help with this. Um, so it's a good idea to keep these documented very clearly. Um, haha, we, we've already done that breakout. <laughs> okay. Um, so labels, yeah. So another thing that I really, really love about issues is that you can uh, label them. And that is really convenient because um, you could say, for example, something like, this is a bug, this is a problem. And my single favorite uh, label is the good first issue or first time is only. Um, and the reason for this is that when you put a label like that on, you're signifying, hey, I want people to contribute, but not only do I want people to contribute, I, I'm willing to guide you through it. Um, because as you may have noticed, there are a lot of terms to learn about. There are a lot of different buttons to click in ways that even when you're trying very hard, if you're not familiar with the system, you may, you, you may end up clicking something that doesn't do it quite like you hoped. So, um, there is nothing I find like the joy of someone saying, this was my first pull request and you've really helped me. Um, it's one of my favorite labels, but um, I just think of them as ways to flag different things. So it might be that, um, for example, you have a lot of documentation that needs to be done in your repository. So you might say this issue is a documentation issue um, or this issue is a JavaScript or a Python issue. Um, or this is a design issue if maybe you're designing a logo or designing what your website looks like um, or a project management issue. So there's lots of different th labels that you can use to help organize things and attract the right type of contributors, um, the right type of work, depending on what you're doing. So I, I recommend using them. Put five, put six, use lots of labels, just stick them on there. They're free. Um, and at this point, congratulations, we have learned about commits. We have learned about issues. We've learned about pull requests um, and what hopefully comes after a successful pull request, which is a merge. Um, and there's a thing, there are a lot of other things apart from this that you can try out in your own time. Um, GitHub is very actively developed and lots and lots of new features get added in all the time. Um, the next thing I think we're going to cover briefly, but probably not have a, lot, a bunch of time to actually go into, is that you can make your websites with GitHub um, absolutely free. You don't need to pay anyone to do it um, and using the tools that we've already worked with. So if you've created a little bit of markdown with you know, bullet points and with um, headings, et cetera, then you can actually make your own GitHub, GitHub website rather. Um, so it's okay. Don't be, <laughs> don't be frightened uh, is the main thing that I will say. Um, 
I do mistakes on the internet all the time, like all the time. I am, I'm a very good typoist. Um, so we will talk about how to get to it. Oh, the other thing I'll say more importantly is that if we're look, looking at open research, then trying to actively share even early on um, means that you have more chance for people to learn what you're doing um, and to maybe offer corrections if you do make a mistake. Um, so uh, creating a small website allows you to share things, allows people to collaborate and um, makes you, allows you to be really open about what's going on in the project and how to fix things. Um, so you can have your own domain name that does cost a bit of money if you want to have a domain name um, or you can just ho host it for free on GitHub um, with no extra cost required. So I'm going to quickly walk through uh, doing it for the OLS friendly collab party repository, I think. Um, so uh, switch to this, switch to friendly collab party. Okay, so this is the one that we've created earlier. You can do the same on your collab party if you want to. Um, so feel free to follow along. Um, so at the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to settings, which is over here on the top right from the entry to the friendly collab party. Um, and then I am going to look over on the left and I can see a bunch of different menu options, but right at the bottom over here, it says pages. So I'm going to click on pages. Ah, okay, I have to make it open. That's no problem. <laughs> if you if yours is already public, this is private. If yours was already public, then it wouldn't go through this step. So I'm just going to quickly hop through, go back to options. And where's public? Make it public. There we go. I'm going to change the visibility. And instead of having make private, I'm going to say make public. It wants to make sure I don't do this by accident. It says I have to type in the repository name to confirm. You might not have to go through this step if you already made yours public. So I understand I'm changing the repository of visibility and now I need the password, good lord. And okay, right. But now we can see up here on the top left, it is in fact public. So going back to where I was at the start, I look for pages on the left. And I'm going to say that I want this, the source for this, to come from my GitHub repository. And so I'm just going to say I want it to come from the main branch. So there are scenarios where you might want to have it from some other branch, but in this case, main is perfect. So I'm just going to say main and from the root folder, you don't need to change anything here. Just to select main and go for the default. And then I'm going to click save. And it says your site is ready to be published. And it's like, oh, well, that was fast and quite nifty. So let's see if I go there. Haha, <laughs> it already says site not found. So it takes a, a minute or two normally just to prepare the site. So if I go back and I refresh this in, you know, like 30 seconds or a minute, it should actually, there we go. Um, and now it shows the readme that we've been working on collaboratively together. This is what Malvika built earlier. And this is now um, the main page for my website. Um, and so you can do things like you can create multiple pages and link to those pages the same way we showed earlier. Um, let me just check on the slides if there's any other specific prompts that I should be showing. So we have some nice examples here of different ways that you can create a website um, so that we have, I will say, hop over to the links which are linked to in the HackMD rather than trying to type these from the screen because um, they can be a bit long. But there are lots of different ways that you can run these types of things. Um, one other bit that I just want to quickly show you if I go back to pages is that you can choose different themes. Um, so you can very quickly change the way that this website might look, choose theme. And I think that this yellow is in fact quite jaunty. So I'm gonna select this as a theme. And once again, if I go back to this repository and I refresh, it's gonna take a minute or two for it to show. And if I come back, you know, again, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, it should have changed and it will have the new yellow and blue theme. Um, from Oh, one other bit that I will add, that's um, the openlifesite.org site that you have uh, hopefully all seen by now um, is, is built on GitHub and it runs on GitHub using the default um, Jekyll configuration, which is a um, type of website, um, website platform, basically. Um, it's the one we've just shown you. Uh, so I'm going to run through the last few slides very quickly and then we'll open the floor for more questions and answers. Um, so don't worry if you haven't gotten everything yet. 
Um, you can ask by email, by Slack. We're always very happy to help. Um, and we were all starters a few years ago as well, um, or maybe even very recently, we, we, we were figuring this out for the first time. Um, so don't worry about it too much. And uh, so that we have some more info um, in these slides about things that you can do, like creating project boards, uh, more information about pull requests, um, and adding more files and so on, like the licensing, which Caitlin, you were asking about earlier. And we're not going to massively dig into it at the moment. And so I think we'll just leave 10 minutes open as free time. This can be questions and answers, or we can actually go and start working on making the website ourselves. And before, before I stop sharing the screen, I'm just going to refresh because I bet this is themed now. It is. Look at that. And this is a lovely blue and yellow. Um, I really like this theme. I think I always choose it. Anyway, um, that is the lightning whistle stop tour of creating a um, GitHub website. And I'm going to stop sharing and Q&A are very welcome. OK, looking through. Oh, wow, Sarah, I love that you had this while we were um, like, I've just minimized, looked at my chat and you've already got your site running, which is incredible. Um, are there tools to manage merge conflicts uh, instead of resolve them manually? So you can resolve them in the GitHub user interface. Um, I've yet to see anywhere that's incredibly, incredibly obviously um, easy and straightforward. Sometimes it's literally like, I'll just say, well, that's the version of the, the, the thing that I want and I'll copy and paste the whole thing in um manually and uh, but there are tools out there that can help you so there's there's tools like github desktop or um source source tree git kraken um, and these are all tools that are designed to sort of step you through merging these changes um as well as managing other aspects of git um does that clarify it at all i just wanted Super. to say sebastian if you are um, if you have the right access or admin access to the repository, you can fix the merge conflict already on the GitHub. If you are not, if you don't have the access as an admin, you can't do it. So, of course, if you want to fix the conflict that you were showing you that was on OLS4, you can't do it. But if we create a conflict on your repository, you can fix it. So somehow the role of admins is to fix the merge conflict, not the contributor. Cool. Um, does anyone else have any questions at the moment? Um, or if you want to sit and have a go at making the website, we can um, turn off recording and maybe just answer any other questions that you all may have. You, you want to answer Jyoti's question on fetching changes downstream. I've totally missed where this is. Is it a Wii UA app? I could do that because I actually have the, the problem that Jyoti was talking about. Go for about. it. All right. So Jyoti asked that when we make a change in our fork or a branch and, I, and we send changes to the main repository, can we actually do it the other way around? So when you have a main repository, the main is developing and you're developing. So you want to know what main has done. So you want to make, pull the change from the main rather than doing the other way around. So there is a very new nifty button that GitHub has added. So I love, I love this one. I was just looking at it. Um, so what I will do is go on my profile because that's where I had made a copy of OLS4. And now there have been some changes. So it says this branch is 19 commits behind the main branch, which is true because uh, Yo just recently merged a lot of things. And there's a, there's a button called fetch upstream, which is really, really cool because now you don't need to wait and do lots of local Git thing. You can click fetch and merge. And there you go. Now I have everything that the master branch has. So I did nothing while you were doing pull request and you was merging. And if I go on the notes, you will see that all the changes from the main repository has already been pulled down. So I can continue working while also taking changes that main is doing. Uh, so I hope that answers Jyoti's question. Yes, Malika, one more question. So now you explain how I have uh, how you took on the changes from main 
uh, to your uh, branch or fork. So now my question is from someone else's fork, can you uh, can we take those changes into our fork while those changes are not in master? Am I clear? You're absolutely clear. You can do that on uh, definitely on the Git. Um, I am not very sure if you can do that from other branches. So this is a problem for local. You can, Yo, do you think? I think if you're in the pull request page, you can you can change the fork that you're bringing it from, or the branch that you're bringing it from. So it's probably possible. Okay, so you you would probably hope to create another pull request rather than the fetch merge option. Jyoti, um, we can probably send you some yeah. relating material later on. There is always yeah. a way. It's just that some of the ways are much simpler than the others. Uh, whereas some other needs some Googling and Stack Overflow or just asking each other. Yay. Okay, I think we should stop recording because we're going to celebrate everyone's website right now. You would hear us shouting wow and yay and everything. So thank you all for joining us and please keep on asking questions on Slack. With that, I'm going to stop recording.